Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to Howard Community College. We have a very special evening ahead of us. And um, I'm going to start with um, this wonderful book. And this book was written by um, Marion Masolia's father, who was a World War II veteran. Um, and Marion is actually coming down the stairs. Uh, she's very busy today. But um, as this book, Bridges to Freedom, helped to build the bridges, um, a bridge between our HCC study abroad participant and World War II veterans, Don Casey, who's here um, in the room tonight, uh, back in 2012. Tonight, we are building a new bridge between our distinguished World War II veterans panelists and the HCC community. It is our responsibility to continue to build bridges so that, that our new generation knows and remembers that the bravery and sacrifices of all of those who served during World War II has allowed us the freedom we hold today. Before I ask Professor Campbell um, to come to the stage and present and introduce our panel speakers, I would like to share with you a short story. Um, my name is Christelle Kane. I'm the International Education Director here at HCC. And I was born and raised in France. Um, I grew up in a family who fought, fought against the Nazis, and um, some of my family members um, um, lost their lives as well. Uh, my grand aunt lost her father when she was 12 years old. Um, her father was on, a, on the way um, to see his wife, who um, just delivered their last newborn. He was arrested by the Nazi and sent to, um, this is very emotional, um, to concentration camps. Um, his, his family never saw him after this, and for many years, uh, sorry, it's been a very emotional, uh, emotional two days, and it will be tonight as well. I hope you have your tissues uh, with you. Um, they never saw him again, and till this day, they still don't know how he died. So the point I'm trying to make is that those memories were passed on to me, and I will pass that, them on to my daughter. Um, it's important not to forget, and this is a privilege for me tonight to have um, World War II veterans with us sharing their stories. So from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you. And now I'm gonna leave the stage for Fred. Thank you very much. reiterate a few of the things that Christelle Kane said. I just want to go over just very briefly the uh, format of tonight's uh, event. I'm going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes just giving a little bit of background about how this night came about and just a little bit about the Second World War itself, but I'm not going to go into a long lecture about that. I'm sure any of my former students will be appreciative of that. Um, but then we will invite the veterans up to the stage. We'll spend approximately about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I will be asking them questions, uh, which they will all respond to. And then we'll have about a 20 to 30 minute uh, audience participation period where you can uh, ask questions. And then after that is over, we will have a, uh, some time uh, outside of the Smith Theater where you can meet the veterans uh, yourself, uh, take pictures, uh, talk to them and that will conclude the night. All right, so that's how the night is going to hopefully unfold. Um, in terms of what I want to convey to you before we have these gentlemen come up, um, the way that I sort of look at things as a historian is that when we, uh, according to William Shakespeare, shed off this mortal coil, we go off whatever is after this life, the thing that we leave behind are memories. Memories for other people to keep to cherish and to pass on. And for our failure to do that, then generations that come before us perish in our memories. I truly, wholly, and totally believe as a historian that that is my sacred mission in life to do that. And in particular, with the Second World War, I have a very direct connection to that. My grandfather served on the USS Nevada, and I had two other relatives serving one in the European theater and another in the Philippines. And their stories always intrigued me, and it was the first period of history that I became involved in, or became interested in, when I was a young child. 
Now, in terms of what we're going to do tonight, an English poet once said that better to have one crowded hour of life than to live in an age without a name. And what we're going to do tonight is hear some of the memories from these gentlemen's crowded hours. Because it's in those hours that we tend to have the most vivid memories. And therefore, what we're going to ask of them tonight is to share some very poignant stories, some of which would be very emotional, sometimes sad, once in a while funny and happy, which is what life should be about. But I hope to convey these ideas to you, and I hope that they can do that also so that you take these memories and then pass them on to others. So that's what my goal is. Now, in terms of the Second World War itself, and in this particular um, uh, uh, night and event, what we're doing is uh, linked back to the book that Christelle Kane talked about. A few years back, one of my colleagues left the book in my, my mailbox, and I was intrigued by it. It was a book written by a gentleman who was in the 238th Combat Engineer Battalion that served in Normandy, in uh, the rest of France and Belgium, and all the way into Germany. And I read that book and thought it was fascinating. Went and talked to my colleague about the gentleman who wrote it, who was her father, who had passed away before I ever met her. And then I found out that this uh, group met every single year and had a reunion since 1947 all the way up to the present time. And I thought, well, fantastic. Can I meet any of these gentlemen? Which I did. And then I found out about one particular gentleman, Don, uh, Don Casey. He was willing to come to this college before. We had an event similar to this where he shared his experiences. And then I found out that he had never been back to Norway. Now, sometimes we have to respect that of veterans, that they don't want to go back to the places where these things happen, and that's fine. But I asked him if he ever wanted to go back, and he said yes. His whole life he felt as though he wanted to go back, but never had the opportunity for one reason or another. And my mind instantaneously said, well, we've got to make that happen. <clears throat> so we raised funds here at the college, and two years ago, a group of students and myself were able to go back to Utah Beach and have Mr. Casey go back to the battlefields where he served in. We went to uh, Colville Cemetery, we saw it where his comrades had passed away, and it truly was the most poignant moment I've ever had in education. And so, two years later, today, those gentlemen are back here in Columbia for a reunion, and we invited some of them to come here. And then we broadened it and asked a number of other veterans if they would come and share their stories with us, with us, which they said that they would do. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Now, why is this important? Well, to be just morbid for a minute or two, this generation is passing. The statistic that I've read recently is we have about 500 uh, World War II veterans passing away every single day. And every time one of them leaves us, we can no longer ask them questions. And therefore, it is critical and crucial that we ask these questions. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, their stories are all gone yet. Because what we have, are plenty of veterans who are out there sharing their experiences and talking about the, the, the things that happened to them in the Second World War. The gentleman that's in the Senate there, he's the oldest uh, World War II veteran. His name is Charles Mazur. He's 108 years young. He's still out there sharing stories. So it's about finding those people, asking them those questions. Now in terms of the Second World War, Without going into a long diatribe about the war itself, that would take a very long time. And if you're interested in that, I do teach a World War II study abroad class, and you're all welcome to come on it, all right? But for the really short, sort of brief version for us tonight, the Second World War was the largest war in the history of mankind. At the end of it, 2.95% of the Earth's population was killed. We have 11 million Russian soldiers alone dying, which was more than all of the participants in the First World War combined. The war was everywhere, and for us, the war started, and many people know this date, on December 7, 1941, but it didn't start for other people on that date. The war goes back to 1939 for people in Poland, it goes back to 1937 for individuals in Ethiopia that were invaded by the Italians, it goes back all the way to 1931 when Japan invaded China. So the war stretched on for a long period of time, but for us, and that's the group that we're going to talk about, Americans, today. We're going from December 7, 1941 to August 12, 1945, when the Japanese surrendered. And where were these individuals fighting and participating in the war? Well, the short answer is everywhere. It's probably the most apt war named in history. It's a world war. Everywhere. These individuals were fighting on the more well-known um, battles 
like on D-Day, which most people have heard of. We're talking about battles in, uh, on uh, Iwo Jima. We're talking lesser known battles like places in Tar Tawara and Peleliu. We have individuals, every time I point, just go. Right. We have people who are serving in the North Atlantic in frigid conditions in the Atlantic convoy. We have individuals in the heat down in Midway in the Pacific. We have individuals serving under the water in the submarine forces. We have people above the air in the skies fighting for the, the uh, Army uh, Air Corps. People are fighting everywhere. And it doesn't matter what these individuals do, did because we, we tend to think of Hollywood history and the people carrying the gun on the front lines. And that's true. We have people serving in tanks. We have individuals, however, that are fighting behind enemy lines, cooks. We have uh, delivery servicemen, quartermasters. We have medics. We have artillerymen. But the regular sort of average GI Joe the person who's serving everywhere and anywhere on this planet is doing his bit regardless if they're carrying a gun, they're carrying a spatula, they're carrying a set of keys to drive a car because all of this is part of how we won the war. And so we're going to hear some of those stories tonight. Now, in terms of the stories that we're going to hear uh, from our veterans, I'm going to introduce them one at a time. I'm just going to give a very, very, very short bio because I want to hear more from them about their stories. And then we'll start asking them some questions, okay? So the first individual I would like to, to welcome up here is Mr. Donald Casey, serving from the 238th Combat Engineer Battalion. Next, we will have Henry Ford Muzan, who served on the USS Intrepid in the United States Navy. Next, we have Louis J. Schott, served in the United States Marine Corps. Next, finally, we have Herbert Sauber, served on the USS Canberra in the United States Navy. Oh. Marianne, we want it, Marianne, we want it to be there. I was going to be in the center to pass if we can shift. <laughs> I don't want to take center stage, but if I'm in the middle, it makes it easier to pass the microphone around. Sorry about that. So before I get into any answers, uh, questions and answers about that, I'll also introduce, this is Marianne Massioli, the individual who gave me the book and started all this. We should give her a round of applause. And I would just like to say before we get into these uh, questions and answers, just personally for me, and I know that I reflect the feelings from the audience, I want to thank you gentlemen for your service, and we're thankful that you're here tonight to share your stories with us. Okay? All of you have water down there if you need it, okay? okay. Is this one working now? Can I, I have to hold that one? Okay. This. Green for me. There's no green. That's the, all right. uh, technology. All right, so go ahead and head over there. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. So the first um, question that I would like to ask these gentlemen, and... Is, is just to get a general overview of uh, when you joined the, the military, what branch of service you were in, and then when you were uh, discharged from the United States military. So we'll start down here, and we'll pass it down. So we'll just get those facts, and then we'll start getting into some specific stories, okay? okay so when, when, were, uh, you, when did you go into the military? I went in the military at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, on November the 26th. 1942. Okay. We'll pass that down for a second. Mr. Muzan, when did you join? I didn't join. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was drafted. <laughs> when did, did somebody join you? <laughs> <laughs> I was drafted December the 23rd, 1943. Okay. All right. And we can use that one. Sorry. Yeah. We'll share that, that microphone. 
Hi. I was in the Navy. All right. You, sir? All right. I'm, uh, I'm Lou Schott. I'm uh, retired from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I entered the Marine Corps and uh, or I, signed, I joined the Marine Corps as a reserve uh, in uh, June of uh, 1942. I went on active duty December of 1942. I joined the Navy January the 2nd, 1942. I turned 18 New Year's Day and was on my way to Norfolk the 2nd of January. Um, now, my, my next question is, is, for most of you, your first experience in terms of the military would have been in training, whether boot camp or basic training and such, and I was wondering if all of you could share your experiences, uh, good or bad, and memories that you had in terms of the training that you experienced before you were sent off into the combat zones that you went to, okay? And we'll start over here with Mr. Uh, Mr. Casey. Yeah, do I remember I got to Plattsburgh Barracks, New York on January the 6th, 1943, temperature 18 below. <laughs> and uh, we had extensive heart training and, and engineer training. And uh, we did bivouac sometime out on Macon Reservation and we'd sleep on, outside in February and March in, in that weather. Uh, but there we learned all the skills of, of, from building bridges to laying minefields, removing minefields, and uh, just uh, all the general uh, engineering tasks that we would have. I was in a surrogated neighbor. It wasn't much to do for black cell then. But we did have boot camp training. And we go wake up five o'clock in the morning, go to the mess hall, have lunch, br or breakfast, whatever you call it, and go to the drill field and drill for an hour. And after that, we would go to the swimmer. We, you had to qualify in the Navy to swim. If, if you didn't qualify for swimming, you couldn't stay. And after that, we would, I was in, in December in 43, and I seen it snow every week, and I was there for, for eight weeks. And, and we would clean the, the whole drill field, which was a mile, and then around the bars where we uh, sleep at. And that was the, the, the basic training that we had. But my most training was after boot camp, when I went aboard ship. Can I go into that? Sir. Yeah. We was mess cooks. That's what the black guys were. But they choose 20 guys, and I was one out of the 20 that they choose to be gunner's mate. And the ship that I was on, the USS Intrepid, had six crew, uh, torpedo crews from uh, the Japanese. And that's why I went this purple heart. I, I got wounded. But during that time, 10 guys got killed. And two of them applied for uh, a Medal of Honor. And it took them 30 years to get it. And when they got the, the, the Medal of Honor, they didn't live five years after, because I saw it in the paper when they died. One was from Pennsylvania, Jones was from Pennsylvania, and Alec was from Louisiana. Okay. Well, when, on December, on December 6th, I was a junior at LaSalle College. I happened to be a goaltender on the ice hockey team, and we were in Georgetown or we were in Washington, rather, and we played uh, 
Georgetown University in a ice hockey game on the night of uh, December 6, 1941. And uh, incidentally, uh, the game didn't come out too well for us, but that was very un unimportant because the next day we were waiting for our transportation back to Philadelphia. We were sitting in a hotel lobby in Washington and over the radio, there was no television, of course, at that time, we heard about the bombing on Pearl Harbor. So right away, we knew that that meant a great change in our lives, and we all started to talk about what we were going to do and so forth. So what I did, I joined the Marine Corps Platoon Leaders Program where you uh, had a chance to finish uh, school, get your degree before you went in the Corps. And uh, I joined that, and I was kind of hot to try it. I wanted to get in the war as soon as possible. And uh, so I took a summer semester, and, and uh, so I could uh, get my degree quicker. And uh, I didn't quite last long enough to be with my graduating class. I got orders about a month before I was to graduate. So. My professors all made up special finals for me and so forth, so I did manage to get my degree, but my father was at my graduation to accept my degree while I was in Paris Island. After Paris Island, uh, I went to Quantico for officer's training. So it took about nine months, and I was, uh, I was commissioned in uh, June of 1942, 40, uh, 43, excuse, excuse me. And from there I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina in a replacement battalion, which was just what the name implied. We were to replace, we were to, to, to replace those men who were either killed or sent back from the Pacific. Yeah. And uh, I was assigned to the 5th Marine Regiment that's the 5th Marines, which was part of the 1st Marine Division. And that was a division that fought on Guadalcanal, New Britain, Peleliu, Okinawa, and after the war went into North China. I was, uh, I was a rifle platoon leader on New Britain and, and Peleliu, and I was a uh, I got hit the 11th day of that battle. I went to the hospital, in the hospital for a couple months. I went back to the battalion, and I had a, a company on Okinawa. I got through that one okay. And then I went into North China. By that time, I was over there almost three years and without getting home, and after three months or so in China, I came back to the States which time I, I got out of the Corps. I stayed in the reserve, though. I stayed in the active reserve, and I retired from the Marine Corps in 1967. So. Having been living in Baltimore, uh, there used to be little ships down on Key Highway. And when we went to boot camp, we went down on an overnight steamer from Key Highway to Norfolk Naval Training Station. The thing I remember most about it is it was a cold winter. And I had a hard time learning how to make beds. I had a hard time how to wash clothes just turned 18, and when then, like one of my compadres say, you had to learn how to swim. If you didn't swim, you didn't get liberty from boot camp. So that was a big deal. When I finished training, I applied for hospital corps school, was sent to Portsmouth, Virginia, took six weeks of training there, 
and then went to dental attention, dental hygienist school, which I graduated from. I was sent to Virginia, to North Carolina, when they were forming the CBs. We were ship's company there, and I traveled with the CBs to whatever port of debarkation they were sent to, and then returned to Camp Perry. For those unfamiliar with Camp Perry, it's now the headquarters of the CIA. It used to be a naval base. In 43, I was dispatched to San Diego and was assigned to the USS Canberra, which was a heavy cruiser. It's the only ship in the history of the United States Navy that's named for a foreign capital. So we were honored. From there, we went to the Pacific. I served my whole time till Christmas 1945 when I was discharged in Boston, Massachusetts. We were in Boston because we were torpedoed at the Battle of Savo Island off the coast of Formosa. Unfortunately, we lost all the men in the engine room. We were brought back to this country by tugboat. So we had a long journey. I was discharged at Bainbridge, Maryland, Christmas morning, 1945. And my other memory is I have a son who later years was born on December 7th. Now, you two gentlemen had spoken uh, briefly about the, the locations where you had served while you were in combat, but we didn't hear that from you two gentlemen. So I would uh, like just real quick uh, to go over in general where you served, and then we can talk about some specific experiences. But where um, was your ship, uh, where did it serve during the, um, the, the Second World War? And then we'll talk to Mr. Casey about where he served in the Second World War in combat. So. My ship served the whole time when it wasn't in port for because we was bombed twice top hitter and suicide plan once in california dry dock the rest of the time we served in, in okinawa that's the last place of the war uh, guam truck formosa and luzon those were the places that we struck uh, bow. But I, w I didn't, didn't, didn't see when I went in. I, I went in in 43 and came out in 45. And, and uh, the time that I served was at Banbridge, Maryland. But the place now, they did away that camp now. It's Perryville, the name of that place now is Perryville. And as I stated, it, it, it wasn't much for the black guys to do but food handlers. It wasn't no, no school for us to go to. The only thing that, that we did together was fight. We didn't even eat together. As I stated, it was segregated, which it, it didn't matter to me because I came out of the South and I went back there when I got out. And I could, I could live with anybody. But the Navy have given me a corral. It caused me to, 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 to buy a home, purchase, I guess, five automobiles and pay cash for them, and get a pension every month. That's what this purple heart's for. But I, I, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so where, whereabouts did uh, Mr. Casey did you serve when you um, uh, left the states? In, in, uh, well, just before we left the states, we went to Elkins, West Virginia, for Mountain Climbing Demolition School, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and Patrick County, Virginia. And we left the states on the 13th of October in 43, and we supposed to be going to India and to the Burma Road. But uh, we landed in Oran, North Africa, and Algeria. And I stayed there until the third day of January in 43, 44. 
And uh, we, uh, we left there and went to England. And from England, we did extensive training and uh, pre preparation for the invasion. Then we made the invasion on uh, uh, June the 6th and 44. But uh, I often tell the folks I never got to travel much, a little country boy, but I've been on th three continents, 13 countries, and 43 states. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we d did extensive uh, training in England and getting ready for the invasion. And then after, and you landed on um, Utah Beach. I landed on Utah Beach, bright and early on the 6th. <laughs> and uh, I would like to take this opportunity, a uh, part of maybe one eight hundredth of it, but I'm a part of that book, and I'm thank you, I'm proud of it. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, oh, you hold on to that. You hold on to that. So, now, what I would like to, to ask of you, and, and, and uh, feel free to share whatever experiences you wish, but I would like to ask about um, any specific uh, memories that you have in terms of combat itself, in terms of the time that you served, and anything you would like to share in terms of that period of the war itself. Any, we can start with whoever. Mr. Casey, you want to go first? Okay. Mr. Casey, go first. You're talking about one experience that really stands out? Yeah, like one experience that really stands out from your the, time. I have quite a few experiences straight now, but the one that I can never forget, I'll never get off my mind, we had a truckload of mines to blow up and, uh, and wounded and killed quite a few people. And I was the first one to the accident and I immediately started acting as a medic. The, the medic was the first one I got to, and he was dying. And I took his kit, and I started going around and helping the different ones. If they had a heartbeat or breathing, I gave them morphine, and I was very careful not to go into venous if I could. And uh, then I just I kept going from one to the other. I'm afraid of snakes. But I saw two serpents on a medical medallion, and the hand was on my shoulder, and this captain from the 101st Airborne wanted to know if I needed any help. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And uh, he had his medics with him. They took over and started to work until our medics got there. And he told me, uh, don't go away. I want to talk to you. And, and when we got through with, with all the patients there, uh, he told me I'd be recognized for that and told me to stay in touch with him. A few days later, I ran across his unit again because we were moving pretty fast in, your, in uh, uh, France then. And I went in and I never forgot, I wanted to hit the guy almost. I asked for the captain and his answer was, it's too late, buddy, he got it yesterday. And I thought that was a cruel answer. But. Uh, then we had uh, other things uh, in there, and particularly in the Battle of the Bulge uh, that I can remember much. And uh, then one of the things after the military is my trip back to France. I've always wanted to go back, and Fred uh, mentioned that. And I'd like to say thank you to the school and the Fred and all the staff for helping me. Thank you. <laughs> 